Good afternoon again, and thank you for this opportunity um, to interview you um, on your art career and your involvement with photography. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, you, um, not, you came to my attention primarily because you're now my professor, but I saw some work that you were involved with and in that mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure how it's classified, uh, be it street photographic display or, but it was very intriguing and um, for me, uh, breathtaking. And I shared it with some of my other professors who were very impressed with the work. And um, I'm currently enrolled at Montgomery College in Tacoma Park, Maryland, taking a class on digital fine art photography. And so this interview is in part uh, fulfillment of that requirement to prepare a paper. So now I understand that your, your, you know, your primary medium right now is not necessarily photography, but art and photography often goes together quite mm -hmm. a bit. So I believe where I would like to start is if you would share, first of all, a little of your background, uh, where you grew up, what were some of your inspirations, um, any special moments that you'd like to share? Okay. Um, well, I was born in Tobago, of Trinidad and Tobago, but I moved to the Virgin Islands that same year, in 1974. Um, so I consider myself a Virgin Islander. I lived in St. Thomas first, and then in St. Croix. So I was raised in St. Croix. My biggest art influence um, as a child would have been Leo Cardi, who was an uh, artist from, originally from the States, but was very influential, who spent most of his career here in, in the Virgin Islands. He was my art teacher all throughout my life, you know, um, my young life, until I went on to college. And I was that kid in class that could draw God, you know. I remember I used to like to draw things like Garfield, cartoons, you know, things that kids like to draw. But I, and he was the first person to encourage me, you know, you're good at this. I was his teacher's pet. I was the one that he would ask to show other students stuff when maybe he was a little too busy or he was doing something else. He would say, go ask Levan to do it. Levan, go show so-and-so how to do it. <laughs> So I, it was something that I knew I was good at, and I felt good about that. And um, but when people asked me if I was going to be an artist when I grew up, I would say, Oh no, mm -mm. I'm going to be a doctor. <laughs> I'm going to be a lawyer. I want to be something like that. And so when I went off to college, I actually was pre-med. And then very quickly, probably about the second D on my chemistry test. <laughs> I realized, even though I was generally good in science and math, I, I just, the path, the path wasn't right for me. And um, I was at Columbia University, which did not have, at the time, a very strong fine arts program, nor was I necessarily that interested in the arts, but I knew uh, I wanted to do something with communication. Um, so I was thinking maybe more I was going to be a journalist. So I took a ton of writing classes, majored in English, and then it was my junior year where I took another class and painting again and that was when I realized that you know this is what makes my soul soar and I decided to try to figure out how to pursue it full time and it took many years to figure out how to do that mm -hmm. but um, there were people who helped me along the way I think probably the biggest influence is just meeting and seeing artists I remember uh, my father's side of the family is from Barbados and there was an artist there that when I would visit my aunts and my uncles and cousins in Barbados, his name was Omawale Stewart. And he was one of the first Caribbean artists I met that that's all he did. That's what he was. Didn't have another job. That's what he did. Um, here on St. Cor, that person for me was Maria Henley. That's what she did. She was in her studio every day from morning till afternoon. And just being around people like that and seeing their work ethic and seeing, you know, how they, how dedicated they were to their craft, I think was inspiring for me as a young person in my 20s. Um, and so I moved from New York to come back home with the intention of figuring it out how I was going to be an artist. At the time I was a painter and I did like these symbolic and figured it. I was very intuitive in the way I approach art. So sometimes I would just kind of start making drawings and whatever I saw, I would make something kind of come out of that. Um, very different from the way that I work right now, but that's how I started off. And 
and it was exciting, solitary, but sometimes frustrating. I realized, so I remember having an experience when I would go to the library, the public library, and I would go try and pick up some of the art magazines that they would have. And I felt like I was reading a science journal. And now I felt, I was like, I feel like an outsider. And I'm an artist, that's not good. So when I would pick up them, I didn't know what they were, I couldn't, I couldn't connect, I didn't know who they were talking about, I didn't know what was going on in the magazine. And I said, that's problematic. Why do I feel so, then part of it was I didn't have any training. So I decided that I would go and get a master's degree, and that's what brought me to Cuba. Um, at first I was thinking I was going to maybe just, uh, I was first thinking I just want more education. So I, was, I first went to Cuba with the intention of just taking classes, and I had thought about some, you know, Dominican Republic was on the radar too, Puerto Rico was on the radar, Cuba ended up working out that summer. And then I just literally, I fell in love with the place, I fell in love with school, I fell in love with someone, and then I decided to move. So I lived in Cuba from 2001 to 2004, and that dramatically changed who I am as a person, but also as an artist. The first few months I was there, I met a woman by the name of Tanya Bruguera, who is a very well-known Cuban artist on the international scene, and her work is primarily based on performance at work. And it was the first time that performance art is kind of like in the art world, sometimes you think it's those people that do all those weird things like smear things on their body and do these endurance stuff. You know, there's sometimes we see them as almost the weirdos of the art world. But the program really focused on the way that art can connect to everyday life and how gestures and behaviors and the things that you see around you, how you could put that into the art conversation. And it was fascinating for me, especially in a place where con traditional art materials are most likely too expensive and out of reach for the average Cuban student. So the other end of that was that the students that I was interacting with made art out of it. I mean, they would take styrofoam, pour gasoline on it, and make sculptures out of the material that was bubbling from that. They would make materials out of galvanized, trash, leaves, what, what can holders, plastic, whatever, because that's the materials that they had and the work was amazing. It was full of depth and metaphors and layers and poetry and it, being around that environment um, was exciting and then also although Cuba is very isolated, it was one of those places that because they're so known for their cultural excellence, everyone from around the world would come. So if I was in my studio, which we would share with about five or six students, there would be people from the MoMA, from Tate, from you know all the major museums all over the world that would come once a year to make their trips. So that was exciting for me too, that I wasn't sure if I would have necessarily gotten that kind of exposure, I definitely not that kind of experience, if I had been in a, a university in the States. And of course financially it was a big one, I mean, you know, spending thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars on an MFA is out of reach for a lot of people, and for me, it was at that time too. Okay. Thank you. Um, with regard to the uh, photography piece, um, the display that we saw was photography. Do you have a background in photography? Can you share a little mm -hmm. about that? What What um, have you done, or what I would say is that the way that I approach my projects and the way that I put art, art now is not based on like um, a medium that I am connected or tied to. So I do have a background in painting and I do have a background in performance art as training more so, but I would say that I start with the project idea first and so if photography makes sense then I would do photography. Um, for example, I did a project that uh, when we had worked in the Wind Plantation Museum um, there's a chair that is called the planter's chair, which is a, the high power, the ultimate power chair in the colonial system. It's where the planter sits, the arm rests, double as foot rests. And in a household, you, not everyone can sit in that chair. It's only the planter can sit in that chair. And what I had done was to invite the public to take portraits of themselves. Um, I would be taking portraits of them in that chair. And it was, so it was a combination of part performance piece, part photography. 
Um, and that's usually the way that if a photography piece comes about, it would be more dealing with the idea and the project, and then photography made sense at the time. Um, and the, the, that project, we had actually done them using um, Polaroids, which is kind of a defunct company now, but we had found a company that's still manufacturing. And the reason why I wanted Polaroid cameras is because cam Polaroids are like, before digital was the evidence because you couldn't be tampered with. So it was almost like taking a, a document of this moment and it gave it this um, instant vintage quality in a way. So that was nice. It was very beautiful. And what we did was we taken, it was about a hundred people who did the portraits and we had then left them. So the opening day was the performance piece. And then what was left was this, uh, you know, a montage of all the different portraits that were done. So that's my background in photography. It's, it's based on that. So for example, a project like that was, those images were not images I had taken, they were images that came out of the archives from the 19, about nine, early 1900s, mm -hmm. like 1915 to 17, or before the Danish transfer to the, the transfer from Denmark to the United States. And they were these documents where people were applying to travel, and so they were, had to take these pictures. Um, so it was an interesting record of the time right before the transfer. And um, what was interesting too about, you know, so we, what we wanted to do by putting, up, up, putting these images up in the building, because a, a lot of our archived images in history is so literally that, it's archived, it's hidden. So it was nice to be able to put those images out into the public sphere. And, you know, then also connecting them to a lot of these buildings that I also see as in danger. So I've been very interested in reclaiming buildings like this, like the one we're in. So with regard to those um, images that you retrieved from, from the archives, can you share a little bit about the process? How did you go about going from the archived image to the big image that, that's there? Um, well, that... That doesn't get done here. Okay. So that was um, another artist who had worked with us. His name is Edgar Andres, and he had gotten them blown up on basically just like laser paper, you know, thin paper. The idea was thin paper so that it could be easily wheat pasted onto a building, and also, you know, cost too. Mm -hmm. So it was just thin laser printed paper and large scale. Um, and the picking selection of the building was kind of interesting because we wanted to pick a building that was going to be highly visible and because that building comes off of the highway you know it did, it did get a lot of attention when i saw um the photograph when i saw the exhibit the first concern i had was it's just regular paper yeah. it's not it's going to last and um and in speaking with the gentleman next door, I was told that was part of the intent. Mm -hmm. So could you ex expound on that a little bit, please? And I know there's a category of art that, um, and I'm, is, I'm blocking on it name. Ephemeral. Yeah. Where it's intended to yeah, be I mean, I think just in the same way that we are ephemeral beings ourselves. We're not lasting, our physical form isn't lasting. I don't think, I think that the same decay that would start to happen to that image and that feeling that you have like, oh, is, I think it's also what I wanted people to have about the buildings because a lot of those buildings are abandoned and neglected. Mm -hmm. um, so it was also this connection of our neglected history, um, but to remind people that people lived in these buildings. I mean, most of the people that would have been in those pictures would have lived in the towns. And so that people make that connection, because sometimes we see the buildings and we, they become invisible. Our history becomes invisible, people become invisible. So the temporality of it was to, to, highlight, to highlight that nature as mm -hmm. well. Okay. That being the case, that being said, and as um, visually pleasing as it was and expressionistic, um, do you have plans to redo or do something similer uh, on maybe on the same scale, a larger scale? 
um, in New York? Um, yes, but not necessarily with photographs at this time. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I do have a few other projects I plan to do with the buildings. Mm -hmm. um, one of them that I just pitched it to the art club at the university to see if they want to help because they're so eager. They're, they mm -hmm. actually helped to, to put those up at the time. Okay. Was um, or is uh, a project that's going to deal with doilies. Mm -hmm. I'm, I've, a lot of my projects have been very interested in the aesthetics of Caribbean interior decor, but the real Caribbean, not the you know, the Caribbean that people, do you see in a resort or hotel, like how mm -hmm. our grandmothers used to decorate their house, how my mm -hmm. mother decorates her house, mm -hmm. where she has on her furniture, you know, these little crochet doilies or lace doilies that you go and buy, and to, it's a protective quality, you're protecting the wood, it's also mm -hmm. decorated, um, but it shows a level of care and attention to your home, and so one of the things that I want to do is to collect a bunch of those and to sew them together so that it covers some of the buildings, which I think would be a really dramatic and beautiful um, project. And that also, again, signals the same, protect, you know, these are the same way that your, your mother or your grandmother is trying to protect this armoire mm -hmm. that she has. It's the same feeling that we should have to these buildings. These are handcrafted you know, buildings of our ancestors. Why are we allowing them to languish like this? Mm -hmm. So those are some other projects that I have in the works. Okay. And <clears throat> my next question has to do with, <clears throat> excuse me, career. Mm -hmm. um, having chosen an art career, mm -hmm. um, looking back, any regrets and any um, thoughts about where you're going, mm -hmm. um, you know, in the future <clears throat> with your art career? And appending to that as my final question, um, what advice would you have for mm -hmm. young people, for educators, and for life learners like myself? Okay. Well, the same woman that I mentioned before, Tanya Bruguera, was my mentor when I was in Cuba. She was uh, the, the program director and the teacher, main teacher of the program I was in. And there was a component of the program where in Spanish she would say, I do arte, there's your art, and yeah, I do carrera, there's your career. And both of them require equal amount of work. You could have someone who has amazing artwork, and they do not have any, no career, you know. And by career, we're not just talking about money, we're talking about exhibitions, we're talking about exposure, um, that you know, nobody knows about your art, even though it's excellent. Mm -hmm. And then on the other hand, we know people who have amazing careers, but their work is bleh. But at the same time, it shows what the marketing and the networking and just pushing, mm -hmm. being professional, what that means. So we worked a lot on that, meaning that we had to practice a lot talking about our work, presenting our work to curators. We had to all know how to document our work well how to keep it archived well, so if somebody said to you, oh, I'd like to see your work, you could say, here's a CD, or here's my website, or here's, you know, that bringing that level of professionalism to your work, documenting where you've shown, if you've sold work, where is that work, you know, the, those professional things about being an artist, which for me, you know, that was the first time anyone sat down and really taught me. I, I didn't, you know, sometimes you think, like, does that just happen? You know, it doesn't just happen that's taught or people will read about it or they learn about it, but that's a, it's a very important aspect of being successful. And you also have to define what success means for you. Being an artist is not a sprint, it's a marathon. For me, someone who can claim to be an artist and still produces work in their 60s and 70s, even if they haven't had a ton of sales or a ton of museum shows, to me that's amazingly successful because it's Life can bring you away from art, as we talked about, you know, oh my gosh, I had this errand to run and this errand to run. So for people who are still doing that and still develop and dedicate to their practice, I find that's incredibly successful. However, you do have to figure out what kind of market, because, you know, art is also a product. So what kind of market is your practice geared towards? Are you interested in being an artist that sells at fairs, like craft and art fairs? or at larger scale fairs like Art Basel in Miami, 
and galleries representing you, are you interested in maybe doing more direct sales out of your studio and having a following more locally? Or do you want to have a following more internationally? Each one of those goals will require a different set of behaviors and actions. For example, I would like to have a career that is more international, but I live in the periphery. I live on an island. So for me, when my children get a little bit bigger, I will have to make the sacrifice of probably traveling a lot more than I maybe would like to. <laughs> because otherwise, how do you make those connections to the metropoles if you're in the periphery? So that, that's something to think about. But on the other hand, I've had mentors like Christopher Kozier, who lives in Trinidad, and has spent most of his artistic career in Trinidad, who feels that this relationship from metropole to periphery, that we need to create our own metropole. Like, we should not always be looking to the US and Europe to validate us. We are our own validation. Because that will stop the brain drain of Caribbean artists moving to all the metropoles to find their way and that we recognize the value of producing in our own context. And so for me, that's why I said travel, not live, right? Because I do plan on making my base here in the Caribbean, but I do recognize that I would probably have to travel more than I can at the moment because my children are small. Um, and in terms of, you asked about regrets. Sometimes I, reg I feel like I should have travel more when I could have, um, meaning without family and kids, that I should maybe have lived in Europe for a little bit um, to kind of establish some of those connections to have the, because now I feel like I'm having to kind of start again. You know, just like any person who stop, stops or slows down a little bit when they're having kids and they focus on that. That's the only regret I think I would probably say that I have, but I had a very strong experience happen to me when I was in Cuba that made me really understand what will always come first. My I was working on my thesis exhibition. You know, it was a very large project. It looked, took a lot of work. I was very focused on it. And in the middle of that experience, my father died. And I knew my father was sick. He wasn't terminally ill. But I remember thinking to myself, I just need to finish and then I'll go home. And no, you know, you don't have any control over that. I mean, nobody. But I remember at my thesis exhibit, breaking down and crying. And I said it wasn't worth it. I should have gone home and seen my father. And that was a hard lesson to learn, but I learned it. So I do, art is so important to me, it's very passionate, but it's not worth my family. And, um, so that will come before, and that's okay. That other people will make a different choice, and that's okay for them. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, and in fact, that's something that I've heard from other artists mm -hmm. as well, um, that it is easy to become so consumed mm -hmm. with what you're working on that it's easy to not really, to miss some of the more important things in life. Mm -hmm. um, so I understand that. Thank you. Sorry to hear about the past and mm -hmm. your dad. Um, but as a follow-up question to what you just shared, um, how would you describe the art scene in St. Croix or in the Virgin Islands? The art scene in the St. Croix, and it's similar, and each island has this particular unique, but it's similar. So we live in a place that's a U.S. colony in some ways that's very expensive to live. The average person here works two jobs, right, and still struggling. So imagine more for an artist. What typically can happen, like for example, when I first started painting, um, I had people interested in collecting my work. The people who collect, they bought it. But that pool of people dries up quick. Quick. Mm -hmm. I mean, and then after that, okay, now they have two and three of your paintings. Are they really going to collect 10 and 15? So the people who are starting to get people to collect, there is a limited pool. So it forces you to do one of two things. You have to expand your market beyond the local scene, or and or you also probably need to supplement your income with not just sales of artwork, which I think is becoming, it's pretty much true for the majority of artists. And that's okay, you know, we don't have to define being an artist as you have to only live from that. Because 
you know, very wealthy artists probably make money doing other things too. Whether they make investments, they create businesses for themselves, whatever it is. You can make money, you know, you don't have to connect the success to making a living. I think that's very important for artists to understand. Um, so I think that the scene that we have here is that one, a lot of local young people, or just not even young, just local artists, um, are producing work that in some ways caters to the market that we have. The kinds of, so the kind of work that people would want to put in their homes, because that's the market that we have. Mm -hmm. So that might include cultural scenes, nature scenes, beach scenes, flowers, mokojumbis, you know, like I said, cultural, a mixture of cultural and nature scenes. Not necessarily work that is very critically engaging, because sometimes that work is a little hard for someone to say, do I want that in my house? <laughs> um, and so what artists who want to do critically engaging work, you have to develop skills where you know how to raise funds to do those projects, or you fund them yourself by making money somewhere else. So you could fund your projects by writing grants, which we have a Virgin Islands Council of the Arts, which you can get grants to do projects. Um, and sometimes you're able to make connections with businesses, depending on what your project is, and maybe they will fund part of it, um, or, or other organizations. Um, then we have a, a large population of, I guess you would call them continentals, that are produced because they are in semi-retirement or retirement, are producing, are now taking this time of their life to produce work. They move to their dream place and they are now dedicating themselves to the arts. So we have a large um, community of artists like that as well. And they tend to produce work that's also nature-based, cultural-based, technique-based. And I think sometimes it's because technique-based work, there's, there's a role in technique. But that doesn't define what art is, right? Just because you can paint an amazingly beautiful flower or beach scene or anything and make it look photorealistic or whatever judgment you think it looks beautiful doesn't necessarily mean that the piece is also critically engaging, which I think that's one of the unique things that art does. It opens up a conversation. It has layers of metaphor in the image, in, the, in what you've done that I think when you were commenting a little bit about your professor saying, well, this may be a beautiful photograph, but it's not necessarily art. And of course, art, you know, the definition is blown open. But when you're thinking about work that's, that, that's critical, that engages a concept, um, you know, you can have a work that deals with flowers, but maybe you've done a series of flowers that people use to poison their slave master or something, then all of a sudden the work now has another layer. So this beautiful seductive image also has a layer that's actually violent to it, that you, and, and a, a resistance, you know, but it's the same, it could be the same image, but it now has another layer because of the investigation that you've done and the fact that you've picked certain plants and flowers to depict that have another meaning to it. And so that's the kind of work that I choose to do because it's like, it's exciting to me. It's a way of, of learning about topics and things. Like even the Cheney paintings that I've been doing, you know, I've, we've seen these images my whole life, mm -hmm. really, but not, but also always small, always as a fragment. And I was really interested in blowing these images up, um, seeing them on a larger scale, and the metaphor that's in there of like, wait, this is like, we, we kind of live in this fragmented reality. We've created a reality out of fragments because we don't really have the whole. We don't have the whole of our African identity. We don't have the whole of our European identity. We're fragments of all of that and we piece it together and it's a beautiful, beautiful society. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the, the, what I wanted to create with these particular paintings. And I think art allows those types of ways to process knowledge that's so different from anything else. You know, by putting images together, by putting an image on a building, by putting a, you know, then it's like you start to see the connections that are formed and you're like, oh, wow, look at that. Mm -hmm. So, and other people do too. They get the same feeling. 
You know, my humanities class, I, we talk about that, that feeling that you get when you get titillated by someone who can, because I mean, we can all write, we can all take a photograph, but someone who can put words together that makes you go, oh my gosh, doesn't that feel good when you hear that? <laughs> You're like, oh my gosh, did you hear that? Oh my, the way you put those words. And it's the same thing, when someone can make an image that makes you go, Thank you. And actually, you answered my follow-up question that I was going to ask related to <clears throat> trying to bring it back to the photography piece mm -hmm. and relating it to fine art photography. So I think you've addressed that very well. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for your time. You're this welcome. has been very engaging Good. and Good. informative, and um, I really appreciate it. Good. Thank, Thank you. you very it was much. fun. Okay. Fun.